Hmm, it's 1.30 at night, I just finished working on some armor attacks, and I finished off a 1.35 the other night. So, let me find something new to start. Hmm, decisions, decisions, decisions. Um, maybe next time. No, no, I, I don't build battleships, so that's out. Do, 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 do. Would be cool, but I kind of need tracks for him. <laughs> maybe, eh, maybe next time. Hmm. Let me try the other pile. Uh, no, no, not this time. Uh, hmm, something Israeli, perhaps. Hmm, put a pin in that. Uh, Panther. Ah, that looks like a fun one. Hey, a Panther too. Those are cool. But, eh, eh, I already did a Panther F a little while ago. Maybe next time, though. Hmm, what am I going to build? Oh, hey, what's this? Hey, that's pretty cool. Vintage Dragon 5C Firefly. Hmm, I do have tracks for it. Maybe this will be the next one. Wait a minute. Huh. <sighs> All right. Let's do this. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com. I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German low heavy tank. Now the model that you see here is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these smaller scale build videos, I often take on commission build projects from vehicles ranging from 135th scale all the way up to 1 6th scale. For availability and pricing information, of course this information will be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. Now, although this model is built mostly out of the box, the base starter kit really does give you a lot of really cool features as well as some other areas to watch out for. We'll be going over all of this information in this video, so stay tuned. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the Panzerkampfwagen 7 Löwe, which I'm most likely going to be Americanizing the pronunciation for majority of the video as low, but this vehicle here was a proposed German heavy tank that was conceived in the early portion of the war. The Löwe, which is the German word for lion, is definitely one of the king of the German proposed paper panzers. The vehicle's design dates back to the early portion of the 40s from 1941 to again 1942. This vehicle was supposed to be an even heavier more armored version compared to the Tiger I which was just coming off of the drawing board and entering into production at this time. When this vehicle was initially proposed it received a VK designation as do most of the German World War II vehicles at this period and the vehicle's designation was VK 70.01K. The K of course stands for Krupp, the firm which designed this vehicle. The proposed vehicle was going to weigh in at 70 tons and utilize a crew of five which would include a driver, commander, gunner, loader, and a radio operator. For the vehicle's main armament, it would utilize a 10.5 centimeter L70 main gun. There are also some different information stating that the vehicle possibly could have been equipped with a 15 centimeter L40 gun or even an 8.8 .8 centimeter L71. The vehicle would have also been equipped with one coaxial machine gun and another pistol port which would have been located in the front bow of the vehicle. Automotive-wise, the vehicle was proposed to originally have a Daimler-Benz DB602 engine. However, the vehicle also had the ability to have equipped on it a Maybach HL230 V12 gasoline engine. Of course, this is the engine which was being utilized by the Tiger I and the Panther at this time. 
This vehicle does borrow heavily from the other contemporary German tanks of this period, which would include both the Tiger I as well as the Panther. Design cues of both of those vehicles are seen on the Lewis. For the suspension, the vehicle utilizes the torsion bar system with the interloven wheel design. The hull's body panels are a puzzle cut and fit type assembly, which again is something which is seen more so on the Panther. Probably one of the most interesting and striking differences on the Lewis design was with the composition of the turret as well as the turret's overall shape and design. Unlike the other German tanks, where they utilize primarily flat armor plate, which is either rolled into shape, like the Tiger I, or are comprised of several flat plates which are welded together, like the Panther, the Lewis design utilizes an all-cast turret. Why this is an interesting data point is because the Germans throughout the war didn't really utilize large castings for components like turrets and hulls. This was generally more of a design feature found on Allied vehicles, of course, like the Sherman or the T-34 or even the Stalin come to mind. Now, of course, the vehicle weighing in at 70 tons would have made it very well armored. In fact, this vehicle probably would have been nearly impervious to the other anti-tank weapons that were being fielded by the Allies at this early duration of the war. Now, with concern of the vehicle's weight, there is a small debate on whether or not the vehicle should be classified as a heavy tank or as a super heavy tank. The Luva, which weighs in at 70 tons, is really only a smidge heavier than the King Tiger, which comes in at around 68. However, debating this is really more or less academic because, realistically, the vehicle never left the drawing board. There are a few drawings of this vehicle that were created and they were proposed to the small mustache man in charge but on somewhere in March of 1942 the project was dropped and cancelled in order to focus funds and resources towards the Porsche super heavy tank concept which of course would be developed into the Moss. Thus sealing the fate of the Luva, relegating it to the realm of what if and what could have been. Before we go over the built model, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with, as well as the kit supply features that are included with this model. And here's the model at the start of the build. As we already known from the video's opening, the base starter kit will be this 135th scale Panzerkampfwagen Sieben Low Heavy Tank from Amusing Hobby. Now the company Amusing Hobby is also a relative newcomer to the 135th scale plastic tank market. Amusing Hobby was founded back in 2011 and they are a Japanese based model company. What really makes Amusing Hobby's kits different compared to the other model companies on the market is that Amusing Hobby likes to focus on kits that are off the beaded path. You're not going to see vehicles like Stewart's or Sherman's or Tigers and Panthers coming out of Amusing Hobby. Instead, you're going to find weird oddities like this tank that I have here. For instance, one of Amusing Hobby's very first kits was their Neu Bafatzeug heavy tank, which was a German heavy tank which did see action in the very early months of World War II. Since then, they've produced an extensive range of weird prototype and paper panzer type vehicles for such countries being Germany as well as even Japan. Now Amusing Hobby are frequently releasing new kits and their catalog seems to be growing every year which is awesome on the standpoint of being a model builder because in the past if anyone wanted to build a rendition of one of these kits in their lineup your only two options were either to find some obscure garage full resin kit which, if you don't have the skill sets with working with that material, can be a little bit of a bell curve with working with. Or your other option was to basically scratch build and kit bash the model outright, which again does increase the difficulty of the project immensely. With these kits here, this is no longer an issue, and these models are all conventional injection molded plastic kits and assemble as easily as any other kits that are on the market. 
Their kits are also fairly prolific, and they do have some pretty good distribution. Because of that, trying to track down one of these kits shouldn't be very difficult. One of these kits can be acquired off of any of the online retailers, from Amazon.com to eBay, to a basic Google search should give you a good yield of where these kits are in stock. Their affordability is also an aspect that they have. Unlike the older wrestling full kits, where they tend to cost upwards in the $200 range, these kits here are much more affordable and can be had at basic market value prices. This particular model here, I believe was purchased off of eBay about four years ago or so, and has been sitting in the stash ever since, and it's about time I crack this one open and get it built. With that pesky rubber band out of the way, this now gives us a good view of the box art. For the box art, we have the low German heavy tank rumbling down a bombed out city street, presumably Berlin or somewhere in Eastern Europe. In the background we have a smoldering Russian JS3 heavy tank, which is definitely appropriate for the subject matter of the low. The illustration is nicely detailed and rendered, not just for the tank itself, but also for the other aspects of the illustration. Here we have the name low, Panzerkampfwagen 7, and the amusing hobby logo. This, of course, is kit number 35A005. Moving towards the rest of the box art, we have here the side panel. Doesn't really much to talk about there. On this side here, we have some corporate information. It comes with a set of word slide decals, and what's also cool is it gives you two frets of photo etch. More information on that is to follow when I crack the box open. On this panel here, we have some CAD drawings of the features that the kit has, including the photo wedge like I mentioned, working suspension, workable track links, as well as a few other options. Cracking open the box reveals the kit contents. Now the kit itself is entirely molded in this gray plastic. Here we have the runner for the turret. The turret itself is decently rendered. We do have some cast texturing found on the surface, which is a nice feature. There's the cupola, what appears to be the gun mount, and you can see how the pieces are starting to render out. The model does give you an option for gun muzzles. We have here a standard German muzzle brake, as well as the vented pattern, which is typically seen on vehicles like the E100. Now, to point out, the holes are not fully molded or drilled out through and through. They are just molded like this on the surface. And here we have the mantlet. Again, same type of quality and casting, which is not too bad. From the turret, now it takes us to this runner here, which is the upper hull. Now, after looking at these parts a little bit more thoroughly, I'll notice that the molding on them do seem to be a little bit more on the simplistic end compared to the type of moldings that are found on some of the other super kits on the market, like from Dragon or TriStar or, you know, kits like Ryfield models, for instance. The details are there, they are nicely represented, but I believe some people will, would consider them to be a little bit on the softer end, like you notice the, the rivets, or I should say the fasteners over here, on the starter plate. The quality of the kit seems to be more or less like something that was seen on Dragon kits of, I guess, the, 19, the late 1990s time period. Which, for me, that's not an insult, as I perfectly love building the kits from that era. So, for me, this is, this is going to be a fun one, actually. Now, the kit also has, you'll notice, the same sides, this side extended fenders in plastic. There is an option to either use the plastic ones or the metal photo wedge ones, which, again, are supplied with the kit. So, that is a nice feature. The components do appear very King Tiger-esque, but, again, that's the design of the low. Here we have the lower hull. One piece molding, it does have its sponsons, which is very nice. Now that this piece is in bag, you can see the parts in the flesh. Plastic is a good thickness, and it's definitely good quality. You can see the torch cut lines found on the front armor plate here. From the lower hull, 
the next runner takes us to the running gear. Now this is where you're going to see the more primitive tooling come into focus. From the roll wheels you can see the little fasteners and their retention plates that are integrally molded on. As well as the hub fasteners that are present as well. Now they are there, they are accurately rendered and detailed, however the detailing on them is not as crisp as it is on other contemporary kits that were out at around this time. Again, like from Dragon or Tristar to name a few. This type of tooling, like I said before, is more reminiscent of the 1990s. Like for instance over here on the center hub of the idler we have a small sinkhole. Of course this will be addressed once the build commences, but you see exactly the type of tooling that I was referring to. Now, like I said before, this is definitely not a deal breaker, and these parts here are definitely more than adequate enough to build the model and have it be a nice representable piece. From the running gear, it takes us to this runner over here, which appears to be some more hull fittings. Now this is interesting, I noticed this on the Trumpeter Yagged E100 and E100 series also, is that the bottom portion here of the armored exhaust cover is sealed off. This to me doesn't really make much sense as on the King Tiger, as we all know, this is definitely open. And being open is very important just for heat, for airflow as well as for water retention as well. And for some reason on these Paper Panzers they like adding this little shelf here. I don't think I'm going to keep that on this build, I'll probably end up removing that with a Dremel. But it's interesting to point out that I've seen this on numerous occasions on, again, these Paper Panzer type vehicles. Here we have a very Tiger One or King Tiger-ish rear muff lap. Kind of interesting. And of course the engine hatch, was, which appears to be lifted directly off of the King Tiger. Next runner down takes us to the remainder of the suspension. Some more road wheels. And what's really cool is that this model here does have a functional plastic torsion bar suspension. Now, I have run into this on several other builds in the past, namely kits from Dragon, like their Smart Kit Panther series, as well as their Smart Kit Leningrad Tiger One kit that I've recently completed. On those kits, I have had mixed results with these. However, that was more in line due to the tracks than, than the actual suspension themselves. On this kit here, due to the next parts I'm going to talk about, this might be a little bit more viable. Which is a good segue directly into the tracks. Now, this model here does have working individual track links, which are a very nice touch. I'm glad they went with this pattern as opposed to the individual link and length, which a lot of companies tend to do, and in my opinion, is just a lazy attempt at completing tracks. Now, I've had seen some reviews online that these workable track links are a bit fiddly to get working, so it's going to be interesting once I actually get to them. And of course, more information on this is to follow. Final runner down is a, looks to be a German... AFE tool set runner with shovels, jacks, other amenities. Molding this interesting brown plastic, but again, nothing too out of the norm. We also have here a clear plastic runner with periscopes. This is the type of tooling which is typically found again on more recent releases. Again, this kit being from the 2012 period, this a kit like this with this type of parts are definitely something that was the norm at this time. Further down takes us to a polycap set, which is interesting, as these are generally a staple on Tamiya kits, but they're right here on the Amusing Hobby. Generic water slide German decals. And on the bottom takes us to the photo wedge. Now the PE is decent quality, but again, if you look at the quality, it looks like something from the 1990s time period. This is something more along the quality lines of the Czech CMK Master Kits. If anyone knows what I'm referring to, you'll definitely see the resemblance. The grill work is there. Again, decent quality and will definitely be utilized on this build. Here we have the fender sections as well. And comparing them with the plastic ones, you can see how much more to scale the diamond weave is compared to the molded in units. 
And of course, on the bottom of the box brings us to the instruction manual. It's interesting, it's actually printed in color, with appears to be a, an inkjet printer almost, which is kind of fun. Here go the quality of the instructions. Very DML-esque in quality. And they look pretty straightforward. If there's any hiccup or any type of inaccuracy, I'll be sure to mention it once the model is fully built. Starting with the model suspension and the run gear, all of these components are stock with the model and were utilized out of the box. Now, one really cool feature that this model has, and I alluded this before to the unboxing, was the ability of having a fully functional torsion bar suspension combined with the workable track links. Now, the workable torsion bar suspension isn't anything that's radically new. In fact, many companies have been incorporating it on several of their new kit releases. One of them is Dragon. Now, if you compare this kit with the Dragon kit, in a few of my other videos where I've built Dragon kits with this type of a setup, I say that the functional torsion bar suspension is a nifty idea, but when you have the single rubber track, it, it becomes a bit problematic. On this model here, that's not the case because, again, the track is workable link. Now, if I take this block of wood here and put the model over it, you'll see the suspension in action. As you can see, the model does have a nice spring to it, and this suspension is absolutely perfect in case you're intending to put this model in some kind of a diorama setting. The weight of the model is pretty good where you can see the suspension flexing, and you'll notice the track, of course, articulating to it as well because of the workable nature. Now, moving this obstacle for a minute, this now leads us, of course, to the track links. Now, the tracks are a very nice feature that they give you in that the tracks are workable. The Musing Hobby could have taken a massive shortcut and done something like give you just static individual link in length or the single one-piece vinyl type, but instead they went the extra mile in giving you the workables, which again is really showing that they want to go the extra mile with their kit releases. Now with the track, I've seen some mixed results on a few online reviews of this kit as well as a few of the other Amusing Hobby offerings. Some of the critiques I've heard are that the track links, although they're workable, because of the way they are molded, some people had problems with first freeing the parts off of the sprues and also getting the parts assembled. When it comes to freeing the parts off of the sprues, because of the finely molded nature of these bits, they tend to be on the frail end. Not as frail as, say, the AFV Club M46 Patton or M26 Pershing links, but they are not too far removed from that type of fragility. And when it comes to gluing the top portions of the links together, where that's how you get your hinging, with the small amount of glue required, it needs to be absolutely precise, and precision is a, is going to be a must. Otherwise, some of the critiques that I ran into claim that if you use slightly too much glue, you're going to inadvertently glue the links together, and they're going to be rock solid, and you're going to have a really hard time with fleshing out the set. Now, I got to say, from my personal experience on this build, I did not encounter that. First and foremost, I already come from a background where I'm used to dealing with these very finely molded track links, so utilizing a clean cut snip and specifically a really fresh one is going to be a lifesaver when it comes time to removal of these track links. It's really really important that you use one of those type of tools otherwise you're going to have a hard time and you are going to break a few key pieces. When it comes time to gluing the pieces on again the best way I was able to get it done was with a really small finite amount of glue on the two sections that the glue needs to be added to. Once these sections are attached, you literally let the track dry, and once it's dry, you could then progress with another little quick span. By doing this, you're not gonna have the risk of the glue bead running into the hinge area and locking everything up. Now, these tracks here, like I said, are fully functional. As, as you can see, they have a nice little flex to it and a nice little bounce. So I was able to get them together without any problems, and they did assemble in a fairly quick manner. Just like with all workable track links, once you find your groove with the assembly, they tend to follow suit. Now one thing I did notice on this build had to do with the rear idler and with the sprockets. Just like on a Tamiya kit, there are poly caps which 
get assembled into these sections over here and allows the piece to get plugged on and it holds it in place. This is a very nice design cue specifically with the tracks because you get to line everything up where it needs to be without the worry of any of the pieces falling off. The tracks do have a little bit of roll to them as you can see. However, it's not something I recommend doing very frequently. A lot of people like to ask me questions about does the model roll? This one technically does, but it's definitely not something that the model was designed for. These, these models are really desi designed to be shelf static display, and you should leave it at that. However, back to the polycaps, I did notice that on the rear idler wheels, I'm not sure if this is a typo with the instructions or if it's just a mistake with the kit, but the polycaps that are supposed to get mounted in the rear idlers over here were too long to fit inside seamlessly. There was a little bit that's emerged from the rear section about a millimeter or two. On this model here I went ahead and amputated that section off with an X-Acto knife. Once that section was deleted the idlers were then able to be assembled and then of course mounted to the model. This problem was not seen on the sprockets however so I'm not sure again if it's something wrong with the with the instructions or if it's just a mishap with the way the kit is designed. But it is something to watch out for when you're building your, your model. While on the rear idlers, like I said during the unboxing portion, there is a sinkhole found in the hubcap over here on both of the idler wheels. This was easily addressed with a little swipe of red putty and was then polished smooth once the putty was fully dry. Luckily, it's only on the surface in the center which emerges off of and stands above the little flange with the little molded in bowl detailing. And because of which, when it comes time to polish and sand the way the the extra putty, I didn't run the risk of damaging any of the other little fasteners. Having said that, you still want to be very careful when doing this procedure though, just to make sure you don't over sand. Once the putty work was done, the idler hubcap is completely blended in and is nice and smooth. And of course, just like in all of my tank videos, all of these Zerk fittings are painted in red, which again is standard practice on these vehicles. And this is true for all of the road wheels as well as the sprocket as well. And the little Zerk fitting would be this little guy right over there. Now moving from the track and the running gear brings us to the tin work of all things. Now this was again another feature that this kit has where you have an option in between using a component that's molded in plastic or a version in photo etch. For this model here, I went with the photo etch route and it was a very simple swap out piece. Rather than utilizing the plastic parts, you just replace them with the PE and everything fits in their appropriate way. Now, why this is done, I guess either the kit was originally designed to have the plastic one, but at some point they decided to up it up for photo etch, or maybe they figured as a as an insurance policy in case someone doesn't have the type of the experience with working with brass and photo etch and are more accustomed to plastic model kits. Either way, it's a nice piece that they give you. It's a nice option. Now on this model here, like I said, I use the, the photo etch and the photo etch went on again without any problems. For the little side plates here, these are again the kit supply ones and you do have to bend them in order for them to fit in place. Now, these were bent, of course, with a nice pair of pliers, and once bent, the pieces had no problems lining up. The angles found on the sections to bend, again, line up perfectly with not only the side of the hull, but also the bottom portion of the fender as well. From the PE now brings us to the rear section of the vehicle. Let me drop the camera down so I could hopefully get everything in better light. With the camera readjusted, hopefully the rear detailing comes through on camera. Now, when it comes to the rear detailing, some of the things to point out are first the tubular convoy light. Again, this is the stock unit and a simple swipe of blue paint was all that was needed to really make the piece pop. Just like, again, with all German World War II AFV kits in general. While on that topic, again, the little reflector light was also painted in gloss red for the same reason, like I mentioned, with the tube light. Where things get real interesting though are on the exhaust manifolds. Now the exhaust manifolds on this vehicle are just like the ones found on the King Tiger as well as the Panther. However, like I may have mentioned in the unboxing portion, for some strange reason the bottom portion of these exhaust armor covers are molded 
solid. This is a feature I've seen on a number of kits, namely these weird paper panzers, like the Trumpeter E100 was definitely a noteworthy one to mention. This is something that, again, it confuses me, and I don't know why they do this, because on the real German tanks, none of them with this type of setup would have had the bottoms closed off. Instead, it's kind of a bad design choice, because this area here would definitely fill up with water if the pieces were closed off, and with these exhaust manifolds being what they are, you don't want to have something that's always exposed to heat that's constantly in submerged water because the units will just rust out very quickly. All of the German tanks with this type of an exhaust layout has open ports on the bottom, again for airflow and to prevent pooling. Now on this model here, I went ahead and modified these pieces the same way I did on the other build that I mentioned with the use of a Dremel with a razor stone. With that type of a tool, it makes very short work of the plastic and once done, in my opinion, really improves the model. If I flip the model over, you get to see the cutouts that I was referring to. It's a very simple procedure, took less than five minutes and is one of those steps that I like to undertake on these type of builds. And that's really the only noteworthy thing to mention on the rear of the model. Now this brings us to the front of the model. Of course, one of the number one things to concern a builder is going to be a seam line where the upper and lower hulls meet. This is just standard modeling and is common again on basically just about any split hull type model kit. On this guy here is just simply polished away with my usual method with some super glue and then with some fine sandpaper. Now, moving along to the front visor, this model does have the option of the visor to be mounted either in the open or closed state. And it kind of has the allure that you can make the piece functional, but after building the piece, I didn't see that being the case. On this model here, I just made it in the closed position and I believe I had to make some modifications to some of the inner hinge work in order just to have it sit in this location here. So if you're building one of these models, be aware of the front visor. That's really all there is to the front. On this portion here, this is just like an early Panther D pattern of vehicle where the machine gun would have been this little plate which would pop open and the barrel would then emerge. It, if anything, it kind of dates when the design of the low was on paper can see where the Germans were at that point. Moving along takes us to the model's tool racks. The tool racks are a combination of plastic with a little bit of photo etch. The majority of the pieces are injection molded plastic. On the tow hook that we have over here, you actually have two little tubes which emerge from the hull and on this kit they're actually separately molded from the hook. This is a little different from most models as generally these tend to be just integrally molded to the hook and just mounted in one unit. With this design this allows you the option to have the tow hook off of the model with the mounting tubes in place. Now although this is a nice feature it can get a little difficult specifically with the recesses and the clearances between the plastic hook and these two units. So some care needs to be exhibited by the builder during this point. Another tool to mention is the axe over here. The axe has a small little holster that protects the axe head from any sort of damage or getting dull. And on this model here, it's actually made from photo etch. It's a very nice piece and it's actually a fairly simple piece to, to remove off of the fret and to bend into shape. But if, if someone doesn't have a whole lot of experience with working with photo etch, they may have a little difficulty with this guy over here. On the reverse side, again, same basic assembly and layout. Now, that brings us to the cleaning saves for the main gun. Just like on all these German tanks, I weathered and painted the unit with my usual method. Now again, one tip I recommend on German vehicles is on the ends of the units, I take a little swipe of brass or gold paint and paint these sections over here. These units on the real vehicle are meant to telescope and thread together in order for you to get the lengths required to swab the main gun. On German tanks, these pieces were brass fittings and you would see them exposed like the way you have it here. Now, just like on most 135th scale tank models, the fittings themselves are not molded in, but with a little swipe of paint, like you see, it makes the component pop and gives you a little bit more accuracy, as again, just leaving it with everything painted in their wood coloring. 
Also, while on that note, I've seen a few discussions on armor forms as to what material these units were made of. Some individuals think they were made from metal pipes, um, and others think that they were wood. From my research on German World War II AFV, all of the wartime vehicles utilize wood poles for the staves with the metal end connectors like you see here. From the tools, this now takes us to the rear deck. Starting with the antenna base, this is your basic German rubber AFV antenna base. The unit is molded into the model and is pretty nicely rendered. The only modification I did was with a pin vise I drilled out the unit in order for me to mount on the wire for use of the antenna. Just like I mentioned on all of these builds, the antenna itself would be rubber and you can see that painted that way on this model. And there would be a brass tube emerging from the molded rubber base, and this is the point where the antenna would slide into. Now, in 135th scale, the best way, in my opinion, to replicate that is with a swipe of gold or brass paint. You just put a nice little swipe on this side here as well as all around, and this gives you the illusion that the piece plugs into it. It's a nice little bit of detailing that's commonly overlooked on models, but if you do it, it really polishes it up to the next level. From the antenna now brings us to the engine deck. Now the engine deck is nicely rendered on this model and as for the low it's basically just a panther or a king tiger pattern of detailing where we have the fuel filler and the oil filler found on these two sections here with the cooling fans and the radiator protective shrouds. The photo etch is the kit supply ones and were simply mounted as is and are very nicely rendered out of the box. There's no need for any aftermarket PE for this kit. Now where things get a little interesting or I should say a little difficult is with these little clips. Now this is something that is true for just about every Panther and King Tiger based vehicle. On the engine deck we have four of these larger hooks on these sections here and on these sections over the fan and radiator work there are these smaller little clips. These are supplied with the kit and are made of both plastic and photo etch. Why these pieces are always a pain in the ass on these late war German tanks is because of the small size of these parts. A lot of times removing them off of this sprue can be problematic. You can easily fling and lose one. Also, when it comes time to gluing them on, you really have to use a very finite amount of glue, otherwise the piece will be too chunky. Because it is finite amount of glue, this makes these pieces very susceptible for falling off from just handling the model during construction, like, you know, putting the turret on or painting it. Or you can even knock one or two off when doing the dry brushing, depending how well the adhesives were used. This model here was no different. Now, luckily, the model does give you several spare pieces. Not so much in plastic, but they do give you several spares in photo etch, and I did have to use a couple of the PE ones in order to fulfill this model. Luckily, the kit gives you a lot, enough spares to fully equip the model, and I got lucky on this model because I used basically all of them. This is one of those areas on this kit where you really have to stay on the ball and be careful with your hand movement. The other area where you have to be careful with is on the front hatch area. This is again true for Panthers and Tiger IIs as well. There are these three little hooks which are used to hoist up this plate to get access to the transmission and just like with the back they do have the same problems with the finely molded parts as well as their frailness and fragility. Again, care must be exhibited by the builder on this location. From there now brings us to the two top deck periscopes. This is actually a very nice feature that this kit has is in that the periscopes, you can mount them in a bunch of different ways with the way they're orientated. This breaks up the monotony of the model by just having all the periscopes pointing in one direction. Another nice feature is that the periscope inserts are made from clear plastic as are seen on a number of other contemporary kits on the market and this guy here is no different. By painting, by molding them in clear plastic, this allows you to paint them. Hopefully it could come out here in the lighting, but you can paint them with their appropriate way and with the pieces being clear plastic, they do have a nice shine to them, specifically on the prism portion. This is true for, again, the two found here on the bow and the other unit found here on the turret. The turret itself is nicely molded. You have some good pitting and cast texturing on the piece. The detailing went together pretty well, and detail-wise, the turret's actually fairly simple. Now, 
The most complicated portions to mention are the little periscope like I did before, but also the periscopes here found on the Commander's Cupola ring. They are made from the same clear plastic that I mentioned before, and on this model, the way I install them is after the vehicle is all painted and weathered. It was one of the last pieces to be installed, just like the other periscopes that I just referenced. Once everything is painted and weathered, the periscopes are then mounted on the inside portion, and then it gives you the look that we have here. Now, to prevent any sort of ghosting from the super glue, rather than utilizing super glue, I swapped it out with white glue, which bonds the piece to the tank in a fairly good manner. It's not as good as some other some other cements, but the white glue is nice and forgiving in that once it dries, it dries absolutely clear, and you don't have to worry about any fogging, which can happen when you're dealing with stuff like CA. Also, and unlike other tooling base model glues like the Tester's Red Tube, it's forgiving if you make a slip up, you can adjust and get the piece where it needs to be accordingly without any worry about any damage happening to the plastic parts themselves. From the turret, this now takes us to the mantlet. Just like with the turret, the mantlet utilizes some really nice cast texturing found on the piece and was a very simple installation. Now, one thing that's interesting about the low is that on the inside, it utilizes poly caps for the trunnion, which is a good way on keeping the barrel nice and snug in place and prevents it from drooping on you. This can be an issue with several other German tanks, specifically ones with really long gun barrels. After a while, because of the length of the gun barrel, the trunnions tend to be a little bit looser on an all plastic assembly and drooping is an issue. With the polycap assembly found on this guy, that's not the case. So it's actually a nice design choice done again by Amusing Hobby. From the mantle it takes us to the barrel and the muzzle brake and the these components here are all stock with the kit. Now for the muzzle brake, I went ahead and utilized the version that we have here. Like what was showcased before, this kit gives you an option on what type of muzzle brake to put on it. The other version looks like your typical German two baffle muscle brake, something that would be seen on a King Tiger or a Panther. This version that we have here is the one I went with because it, it, to me it's more visually interesting and that's the vented muzzle brake which would be seen on something like the E100. Now the tooling on the kit is all made from injection molded plastic and although it has the nice shape to it, one thing that Amusing Hobby did was that the vent holes are actually all molded shut and there's no holes that are perforated through. On the piece here, I went ahead and modified it by taking a pin vise and manually drilling out every one of these little vents. This greatly helps increase the accuracy of the piece and really makes it pop compared to, again, just leaving it with everything molded shut. Now, I did not utilize a Dremel for this, and you really can't use the Dremel. The reason why I say that is because with a Dremel, even at its slowest speed, the bit's going to spin too fast, and it's going to gobble up plastic and it's going to eat away, leaving for the holes looking very, very rough and crude and it'll basically destroy your, your muzzle brake. If you don't have a pin vise, I don't recommend this procedure. In fact, if you don't have a pin vise, I recommend going with the other muzzle brake because it's more user friendly for people who are more primitive with their tooling. Now, while drilling out the muzzle brake, you have to be Careful because there's actually a small little section missing of the vents. This again has to do with the way the pieces are molded. With the type of injection molding used, you cannot have some certain details because this is where the, the molds line up and clamp into each other. So because of that, you're gonna have a section on the top and the bottom of the muzzle brake that are gonna be void of these holes. When I was drilling these out, I went ahead and carefully marked where the holes should be and with the pin vise, I just drilled them out. Once this was done, this gives you the completed look of the muzzle brake that's required for something that has this type of a design. From there, this now takes us to the paint and the markings. Now, because the low is a conceptual model and is a paper panzer, this gives you extreme artistic licensing to go as conservative or as crazy as you want with the camouflage scheme. For the scheme we went with here, I went with a splinter type camouflage pattern, very similar along the lines to the crocodile that I did about a year or so ago. Only on this build, the colors of choice were Dunkel Gelb and Schwarzgrau for the actual splintering. The method was done exactly the same with the use of mass and then everything was then airbrushed over. Also, just like on the crocodile, I left the top portion of the roof of the hull 
left in its base yellow. As again, this is a type of camouflage technique that was done on several vehicles during the war. Another thing I did on this particular build, if you notice, is that the turret was left in its red primer state. This is something, again, very common towards the latter half of the war, with the Germans being in their last-ditch type mindset, where you they were taking unfinished components, mounting them onto semi-finished hulls, and sending the tank off in its mix-and-match state. The same type of procedure, if you notice, is also done on the gun barrel. I left it with its gray primer, which was basically a feature seen on many, many German tanks during the war period. Now for the mantlet, you'll notice that I went ahead and left this with the same matching color scheme as the rest of the hull. This was a, a decision that I made just to keep everything with a little bit of continuity. However, again, having said that, with this model here, you could go as bizarre as you want, and you could even make the mantlet possibly a different camouflage pattern altogether, as arguably could have came from another vehicle. But again, this is all up in the wind and at the discretion of the builder. From the camouflage, this now takes us to the markings. Now, the model does supply you with a set of water slide decals, and the decals consist of a couple crosses, as well as a very generic set of German red and white AFV tank numbers. For the model here, I just went with the crosses, as I wanted to have a less is more type approach with the markings. Again, this is up to the builder's discretion, and you could go as conservative or as buck wild with that as you, as you wish. Now, when it comes to the quality of the markings, they were on par with basically any other kit on the market. They went on without any problems, as well as lacquered and weathered over without anything to mention. For the model's weathering, I went with my usual format with both the airbrush and the dry brushing for the various effects that you see on this build. With all that out of the way, this now leads us to skill level and recommendation. Now, the base starter kit is relatively easy to build with the hull, the suspension, and even the turret. However, because of the workable track links that are supplied with this kit, I really can't recommend this to a beginner. With the amount of frailness and fragility of these small parts, they are definitely going to be far too fiddly for someone who is getting into plastic models for a first time. Something like this would be better left for somebody who already has a few other kits under his belt and is looking to level up. Of course, this means you are going to be an intermediate to an advanced builder to tackle one of these kits. This kit here would be ideal for someone who's already built the Trumpeter E100 Crocodile or even the Trumpeter E100 tank model series and wants to level up to something with a little bit more complexity, but overall is still fairly simple. This kit here definitely fits the bill for that type of an individual. Now briefly brushing up against that brings us to the recommendations. This model here obviously is highly recommended for anyone who is an avid fan of German World War II vehicles. If anyone is a fan of filling in the German zoo, you kind of need the lion to complete your zoo if, if you catch my drift. Another type of individual who would like this build would be anybody who is a fan of the very late war pattern of vehicles or also this type of person who enjoys the conceptual and the prototype version of vehicles that have been released in relatively recent years. This model being a paper panzer would fit really well into a collection of anyone who has the Crocodile, the Moss E100, T28 Super Heavy Tank. This guy here fits right into there without batting an eye. Another no-brainer for a, the type of person who would want one of these kits would be the type of person who is an avid fan of those multiplayer online tank games. This vehicle is present in one or I believe both of those games and if you like playing those video games, chances are you also want to have a little IRL version of the model that's in the game. This kit here would again also really be good at scratching that itch. Me personally, having this built now out of the way, I really am happy in how it turned out. This was my first foray into an amusing hobby kit, and if any of the other kit releases that they have or any similar to the quality on this one here, I could definitely see myself adding a few more of those kits to my stash as well. And that is actually a really, really good thing, because Amusing Hobby's kit lineup consists of some very, very cool and highly unusual models that I do have a bit of interest in. 
Now, when it comes to this model over here, well, after the filming of this video, he's going to be put in a nice, clear plastic case that's dustproof and put on display with the other models in my model tank collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale low German heavy tank prototype. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content like small scale model showcase videos like this guy over here or the 1 6 scale project update videos that frequently get posted on this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have photographs of this particular model as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been posted on the channel in the past. Finally, don't forget to swing by eastcoastarmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks for watching.